All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Barley Dunn. I run the East Hampton Town Shellfish Hatchery and also Shellworks, which is a family sea farm in Little Peconic Bay. And I'm also one of the founding members of South Fork Sea Farmers, which is responsible for tonight's broadcast presentation. Um, so real quick, South Fork Sea Farmers' goal is to educate the public on all things good and sustainable in marine aquaculture and, and inspire some action programs. So that's one of the goals we're meeting today. Tonight is our basically our premier South Fork Sea Farmers specific uh, presentation for our soon to be lecture series. We're hoping to present topics such as a day in the life of an oyster farmer. Uh, of course, we're going to talk about kelp because it's all the rage these days. Uh, we want to talk about pearls because everybody's interested in pearls and why we can't grow them in our local stuff. So we'll talk about that. Um, and we also want to be a hub for other things related to our marine environment. Uh, up and coming is a Southampton Arts Center presentation on restorative aquaculture. And I believe Kim's going to be at that as well. We'll post all this stuff on our website and via our email list, sir. So I would prompt everyone to go to southforkseafarmers.org and sign up, sign up for the email list so you can get all the information on everything relevant to this, this topic, uh, sea farming on the East End and in general. And hopefully we'll keep everybody educated and entertained. Um, I want to thank uh, the South Fork Sea Farmers Board, of course. Uh, we've got Dr. Scarlett Magda, Irene Tully, Kate Gilroy, Mark Miller, Frank Covetto, and Jeff Ragavan and the East Hampton Town Board and the T Town Trustees for giving us access to uh, the waters for doing our oyster gardening programs. And of course, LTV and Jason for broadcasting this. This is gonna be really cool. It'll be on YouTube, which, where's, which is where you guys are watching. So there for all to see. And without further ado, I wanna introduce Kim, tonight's speaker. He's gonna to talk to us about the history of New York shellfish, which is an amazing topic, interesting topic. If anyone, um, for anyone who hasn't read The Big Oyster, I highly recommend it. I believe Kim touches on that. It's a great book, and it'll, it'll, it's, it's just an amazing history of the oyster around Manhattan. So a little bit about Kim. Uh, he re received his bachelor's from Connecticut College back in the 80s. I won't be specific. We don't need to age the guy too much. <laughs> with a dual major in field zoology and marine field biology. He specialized in wetlands ecology. Then he got a master's from the URI in the field of shellfish aquaculture. Since 2000, he's, he, he's been the community aquaculture specialist and director of the SPAT program, which was originally the South Hold Project in Aquaculture Training, and they've since changed the name to Suffolk Projects in Aquaculture Training. This is a shellfish restoration and training initiative and Kim is really the, the, the reason that we're all here. He's the guy that started oyster gardening on Long Island. Um, and so he's got about 250 member families in his program, and they contribute about 15,000 hours of volunteer time each year. They have their own hatchery where they're growing their own oysters for their gardens. So it's a really cool program up there in Southhold. In 2002, he was the Southhold Civic Person of the Year, and he co-authored this great book called The Complete Idiot's Guide to the Oceans, which everyone should take a look at. And, and since, since 94, Kim has specialized in the culture of the bay scallop and has built and operated four shellfish hatcheries. So I'm really psyched to, ha to have Kim here. He's a personal friend of mine. Uh, he's helped me out of a lot of binds on shellfish culture. And he's really uh, one, of the, one of the icons in the industry and a go-to guy for any questions uh, in shellfish aquaculture. So I'm going to I'm going to let him take it away and talk to us about the history of New York shellfish. So thanks again Kim and uh that's it for me. Bye bye. Am I there? Hello? Hey, look at there. But my head is so swollen from all of that stuff that I uh, I didn't know if I was fitting in the screen or not. So uh Welcome, everybody. Uh, sorry we can't do this live, um, but things are getting better, and I'm sure we're going to have lots of opportunities to 
to uh, be, be live and in person again. Uh, my stand-up comedy is much better live than it is when I'm in front of a Zoom screen, but I'll try to keep it light. Uh, I'm going to give a, a, a talk on, on some history of oysters and, and uh, just kind of broad stroke oyster uh, factoids for everyone so that when you're at your next raw bar, you can drop some one-liners. That's, that's usually what I tell my members, that all of these lectures are, are really just so you learn good one-liners for, for at, when you're at your cocktail party. So uh, it's all, you know, for all you members uh, of, of Barley's group, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a language that we're going to learn about growing oysters. And, you know, I think a lot of people know about oysters being uh, very environmentally friendly critters. They, they filter the water, they provide habitat. Uh, they do a, a lot of different things. And a lot of people know that, but most people don't really know a, a, an awful lot about uh, oysters in general. Barley mentioned about pearls. You know, how many times have I gotten a question uh, about, you know, when am I going to find a pearl in my oyster? And, and so these are things that we're learning together as a community. Uh, and, it, and it really is a, a, a wonderful uh, vehicle to learn about the marine environment. Uh, I found that oysters and shellfish in general, is, uh, they're just a remarkable vehicle for getting uh, all age groups interested in the environment, the marine environment and, and ecology and these things. So let me uh, share my screen here. Let's see if this works. Uh, let's see what we got. Are we up? Okay, let me get rid of that thing. There it is. You see that? Okay, so, uh, you know, Barley gave a little introduction about me and, and SPAT. Uh, SPAT has been my... my uh, my passion for now going on 21 years with Cornell. I've been at Cornell 26 years, mm -hmm. Cornell Cooperative. And uh, the SPAC program has been just a remarkable uh, program for me. I learn every day from, from the community. And so Barley wanted in on it and I warned him. I warned him, he knows, he's chuckling that I said, you know, uh, if you if you build it, they're going to come, and you're going to be locked in. And I, I'm I'm locked in, and it's a wonderful thing. I I can't say enough about uh, having community involvement with with aquaculture. So let's go through this, and I I guess at some point uh, I'm not sure if there's going to be chat. If you have questions along the way, I'm not sure how what the venue is going to be, but. Um, Certainly at the end, we could possibly have room for questions or uh, there's my, my email up there if anyone wants to jot it down and you want to converse via email in the future. That's all, it's all good stuff. So let's see what we got. First thing off, what, what, what are we talking about, shellfish? What are, what are bivalve mollusks? And, you know... For the most part, we all know about mollusks because if you walk the beach, it, there's a lot of shells. It's a very, very large invertebrate uh, uh, phylum, the phylum mollusca, uh, second largest uh, after the, the uh, insects, uh, which kind of take over uh, as far as numbers of, of different species. But mollusks are very large, uh, large phylum. And uh, I'm sure they're still finding new, new species along the way. The, the R's that we're interested in, and so when, I'm, I'm going to concentrate on oysters, but we do culture, as does barley, uh, numerous shellfish. And, and so these bivalves are, are similar in a lot of ways. Ours are the northern quahog. Not so. When I was in grad school, you weren't allowed to call our regular clam a hard shell clam because there are a lot of hard shell clams. So it was the northern quahog, and you might think to yourself, "Well, a quahog is that giant 
one of our clams. And that's what we call hogs or cohogs and little necks and cherry stones. Those are all the northern cohog, our, our local species. Uh, the eastern oyster, which we're going to concentrate on, blue mussels, soft shell clams, uh, Maya arenaria, uh, and surf clams, razor clams, bay scallops. The, and interestingly enough, ribbed mussels, which a lot of people know about ribbed mussels, but they're going to become more uh, uh, in the mainstream for hatcheries because they're a species you can grow and cultivate and put in the water that you can do that right now with the regulations in uncertified waters to clean the waters. And, you know, again, a lot of people have asked me in, the, in, in my, my tenure at, at SPAT, can I grow oysters on my dock? Well, let me check the, the, the closure map. No, it's uncertified, you can't grow there. But I wanna clean the water, catch 22. You can't put a harvestable, sellable animal in uncertified waters because there's a potential for poaching pressure. Somebody might come in, take the stock, sell it. Um, so possibly somebody could get sick. So a rib muscle uh, is, is something for, for cleaning the waters that might, might come up uh, in, in the near future. So they're all, they're all bivalves, two valves. Now here's a really interesting thing. And here's your first cocktail tidbit of information. How many times have people said to me, do you grow blue point oysters? Well, it depends on, yeah, it depends on how you want to look at it. Do I grow blue points? Uh, I grow the Eastern oyster, Crassostria virginica. Is a blue point oyster an Eastern oyster, Crassostria virginica? Yes, it is. As a matter of fact, the only oyster that grows from the Texas coast all the way up the East Coast into Newfoundland is the Eastern oyster. That's our oyster. That's our, our singular oyster. Uh, somebody snuck some European flat oysters into Maine, and I think they still culture uh, some of them, but that's a European oyster. That's not our oyster. Ours is the Eastern oyster. It's our only oyster. So when you say, well, what about a, what about a Shinkatik? What about a, uh, a Malpec? What about a Wellfleet? What about a Blue Point? All Eastern oysters up and down the East Coast. Now, if you go to a restaurant and you order oysters, you might not be getting an Eastern oyster. You might be getting a Pacific oyster. Pacific oysters, Crassostria gigas, are the number one aquaculture species probably in, in, in the world. When I was, uh, I was an adjunct professor for a semester at Dowling and I did a little world aquaculture thing. And it turns out that by weight, Eastern oysters were, I think, number, number two aquaculture product after the carp, which carp in, 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 in Asian uh, cultures is clearly number one by, by, uh, by weight. So you would think top 10, you know, uh, shrimp and these things are way down the list. Uh, your uh, Pacific oysters are grown everywhere, except, interestingly enough, on the east coast of the United States. We're not allowed to grow them. Now, you go over to the east coast, uh, the west, the left coast, the other coast, that one over there, my son is in Alaska right now, and he's probably eating Pacific oysters. But interestingly enough, on the, what I call the, anarchistic coast that they get to do whatever they want. They grow, actually, on your screen there, they grow all of those oysters there. They grow the Pacific, they grow the Kumamoto. The Olympia is their only indigenous oyster. But if you go to, uh, if you go to Netflix, a little plug for Netflix, if you go to Netflix and you look up the Chef Show episode four, you'll see a guy named uh, a finger out of, out of uh, Hog Island, Hog, Hog Island Oyster Company. And in that video, he drives up to, and he says, and these are our Eastern oysters. They're growing our oysters on the, on the Pacific coast. How come we're not allowed to grow any other oysters? And I would say that this is the reason why. The Eastern oyster is only grown on the East coast of the United States. It is our 
quintessentially our oyster. There's no other place that there are. On the West Coast, the Olympia oyster was almost wiped out. It's a very, as you can see from this uh, slide, it's a very small oyster, very hard to run a commercial venture with Olympia oysters. So somewhere along the line, they brought in a Pacific oyster, started culturing them, now it's okay, and they added Kumamoto and this, these other things. But on the East Coast, we, it, it's very highly regulated that you cannot bring another oyster into the East Coast. Because if we displace our Eastern oyster with a non-Indigenous oyster, we could lose that, that oyster, and it is our oyster. It's, it's Indigenous to our water. So, little tidbit there. I, however, I wish I had one in my pocket. I picked up an oyster, our, crass, our Crassosher virginica, off the flats, and it looked just like a Kumamoto. So I was going to call it the no foe kum, fo Kumamoto. No foe Kumamoto. But that's the best we can get. It's still an Eastern oyster. A couple areas where we're growing. So there's oysters growing in Lake Montauk and Napig. And certainly here's you guys over here. Uh, I just moved out of Three Mile Har uh, Harbor. I used to live in the Springs uh, as of Sunday. I'm now uh, on the south, on the North Fork, so because my commute was too great. But a lot of oyster growers all around here and around Shelter Island. Uh, there's oyster growers around New Suffolk, a lot in Little Peconic Bay. Uh, all along, th this is, if you get a view of this, so and you've got Greenport over here. And this area, you're going to see slides of the 1900 right at the turn of, of, of the century, where this whole area was the really an epicenter of oyster culture for, you know, and exporting to, to, to Europe and, and to the West Coast and, and uh, was a tremendous hub of, of oyster growing. And what you're going to see during this talk is that back then, 1900, it was aquaculture. It was aquaculture then, and I'll, I'll, I'll describe why. By the way, this is, you know, a part of a closure map. So when you're seeing red, that's uncertified water. Blue is seasonally certified. And if it doesn't have a color, it's never closed. So there is a DEC website. It's called the uh, tracker map or something like that. And, and it will show you every creek, whether it's open or not, if you have questions, if you can grow in, in your dock. Uh, so that is available. Again, our crass Austria virginica. Yeah. Whoa, somebody's got a dog barking. It's not my dog. I don't have a dog. I don't have any pets. My only pets are crass Austria virginica because if they bark at you, you can eat them, uh, uh, I guess. Uh, so anyway, uh, the Eastern oyster, our oyster. And don't forget, you got to learn, you know, I, I was teaching third graders, they got to learn some Latin. So, Crass Austria Virginica. And you can learn that. That's not that hard to learn. Okay. And here is a picture of my SPAT group. No, that's not them. That, who is that? That's, uh, so here's a, a, an indigenous uh, American native tribe. Uh, were they eating oysters? There are evidence of what we call midden sites, huge, some people call them the trash piles of, of the past because they would eat a lot of oysters and just heap up these oysters into shell piles that kept growing bigger and bigger and bigger. What's interesting about that is archaeologists have found that even back then their oysters were quite plentiful, but as you look at the midden sites, the further, the deeper down they are, the larger the oysters are. So even they were kind of fishing out their bigger oysters and they were getting a little bit smaller. Not like our oysters. Boy, if, has anyone been to Manhattan lately? Well, nobody's been to Manhattan at a raw bar lately, but there, it will happen again. We will get to be in Manhattan at raw bars. And what you're going to find is like a two inch oyster is is the going oyster at, at in manhattan you know they don't even want a three inch oyster anymore some people do but and it's funny how it's just gotten smaller and smaller for, by taste now people really like a, a a tiny little uh select oyster so uh but but 
these were, you know, this was a major uh, f food source uh, if you lived along the coast. They were eaten, smoked, dried. That, you know, somebody was just telling me, oh, it was my son, was telling me he had oysters in the refrigerator for a month and oysters in the refrigerator for two weeks. And he opened them up to see how, how different they were. And they were all the same, they were perfect. So even in, our mod in a modern refrigerator, keeping an oyster in there for a month, they're still okay. Well, you know, if you didn't have refrigeration, uh, oysters can withstand quite a bit of, of, of time before they will go bad because oysters have their own internal environment. If they close up and keep their extrapelial fluid, some people call it the oyster liqueur, uh, you know, they can really stay hardy for a long, long time, as you're going to see in some of the pictures coming up. Uh, here's a midden site. That's a the modern midden site. This is a picture of Greenport, actually not all that long ago. I mean, the, the, the oyster industry on Long Island was thriving for many, many years. Uh, the demise of it was really the, the, the kind of the end of the story in a way was brown tide in the 80s because that finished off one of the last oyster companies out out on uh, the north fork of long island that would have been uh, the plock group the uh, uh shelter island oyster company and the, the only one that was really active between you know 1970s and, and and all the way through into 2000s was Frank M. Flower and Son. They were they were out of Oyster Bay. They were they were big and 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 active. But uh, I was just up there a couple uh, about a month ago, and apparently they are no longer they are no longer in the oyster culture business, which I found. Uh, a little, uh, a little disturbing. It was, you know, the very old company, and apparently they're now going to be a restaurant, and, and uh, so we'll, uh, I'm going to do a little bit more research on what happened with them. I, I know Dave Relier and Joe Zatilla quite, quite for a long, long time, and it's kind of sad to see them going out. But you know, uh, this type of oysters, when you see piles. So this shucked oysters, and you see a label here for stewing. I mean, these were canned, you know, the, the oysters were shucked and tinned. And, uh, you know, what was going on there? How come we don't have oysters so plentiful like this so that you have to literally walk up the mountain with a, with a wheelbarrow full of shell and keep building and building this pile of, of shell up? And... Uh, and you'll see what, what, what that was all about. Um, we're going to go through a little bit of that. Uh, there is a lot of history, uh, and there are some museums out on, in Greenport and whatnot. But basically, uh, what was happening was a lot of the waters of, of the Peconics and, and other parts of Long Island were partitioned in such a way that you could get uh, parcels of the of of this bottom rights uh, and you could see here a list of who was growing where in Nappy you had all these names and you might see Gardner and, and, and other folks that you might recognize some of the names and and uh, Orient Harbor and and uh, all along in here see and so a lot of companies and you might see also that some would get other areas and just or kind of you know grab more property by having auxiliary companies and whatnot until you had some pretty good uh, sizes of 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 land to work uh, for the oysters 1935 this map is this is from a book uh it's called uh it came out of the book came out of uh mystic seaport and it's oystering from from Connecticut to Massachusetts or something. I'll have to get, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the citation on this. I really should. It's a cute little book, 
Um, and it has this graph in it that's pretty mind blowing because here's Massachusetts and probably, you know, Wellfleet being a, a big contender in Massachusetts, kind of chugging along at a steady rate forever here. Big demise. Look at this 1960 to 70. Everybody seemed to have crashed right here. But, you know, Massachusetts chugging along, Rhode Island having a nice spike here, Connecticut having all kinds of spikes here. And look at New York, just off the chart, 1910. Okay, so we're looking at this area here, 1900, 1910, where millions of pounds of oyster meats and a lot of it not being eaten raw, really being chucked and chucked and chucked and chucked and tinned and, and moved around, but just off the charts. How did that happen? How did this, how did this huge spike happen? And then how did this happen? That to down to nothing. If you ask me, by the way, as we're looking at this graph, this little blip from 1970 up, upwards, I would say a lot of that was because of Frank M. Flower and Sons in New York. Uh, when I started at Cornell in 1995, the statistic in New York, and it probably hasn't changed a whole lot, was that 92% of the oysters harvested in New York were through were through aquaculture, not wild, wild harvest. And even now, wild harvest, there's not that many people that are actually wild harvesting oysters. There are some spots. They're hard to make a living wild oystering. Uh, so that might be aquaculture. This would have been the new form of aquaculture. And we're going to talk about why this peak was the old form of aquaculture. Okay. And here's why. Because this boat that you're seeing here, full of what look like oysters, is actually boatloads of spat on shell. So what that is, is that boats would go to areas either west in New York, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and a lot of, uh, to, to prolific oyster seed beds. And anecdotally, I've been, been told, and I suppose that the literature is a little over here and over there, that a lot of these seed beds were in less saline water, so more brackish waters, not, not like Chesapeake brackish, which is like 10 parts per thousand, but let's say, you know, 15 to 20 parts per thousand. And by the way, I sound scientific, but parts per thousand is the same as percent, but you just add an extra zero. So... 30 parts per, per thousand salinity is 3% salt. That's all that means. But they, they, you know, again, you're learning a new language and you have to be hipper than the guy next to you. You don't say, oh yeah, that's 3% that's salt. You say it's 30 parts per thousand. It sounds so much more like you, you're, you're science-based, even though you're just learning how to how to get somebody to bring you your next gin and tonic uh, uh, because he's sick of listening to you acting like a scientist. Anyway, uh, I digress. Here is a barge load of spat on shell. They take it from the prolific seabeds. They bring it up to more saline water. So our water in, in Peconics is 28 parts. Open ocean is about 32 parts, so 3.2%. 3, 3. 32 parts per thousand, pretty salty. Uh, all around in here, 28 parts, 32 parts, pretty salty. Uh, and the oysters, given the chance for some space and the salt, would grow tremendously well, beautifully. So you take this spat on shell, which is an oyster shell with little, little oysters set on it. Uh, I, I, maybe I have a picture. I have a bunch of lectures, and one of them is uh, remote setting and, and setting of oysters on shell. I just set a bunch of oysters on scallop shells, and it looks tremendous. These are scallop shells with oysters all over them, and I'm going to plant them along the, along the banks and make little, little topiaries of oyster bushes from these things. It's going to be looking quite cute in a, in a year or so. But this is what was going on here, is that there were so many oysters 
in the seabeds, and they wouldn't make it, by the way, they wouldn't make it to, all of them wouldn't make it to market size. So you would transplant this fat on shell, broadcast it out into your more saline waters, and then harvest them later on. And that was aquaculture. So that was a form of aquaculture because the, it wasn't, a, uh, it wasn't a huge abundance of wild set oysters in the Bacana. In Connecticut, they've, they've been relying on wild set for, you know, ages. Uh, Wellfleet, Wellfleet's out of control. Oysters are set on oysters. They can't get rid of oysters in Wellfleet. Uh, I, my son worked for an oyster company up there and I, I, I went up and visited him and I'm looking at their oysters and there's clumps of oysters and they're chiseling them out and it's, calling them and spinning them and chopping them. And, uh, and I said to the guy, where do you get your seed? And he looked at me like I had three heads. I don't get seed. It just socks into my, my ground. So I said, like, wow, that's awesome. How many do you have? Well, a couple million. And, and all he did was chip them and chip them and chip them to try to get to be a nice, perfect single oyster. But they're all clusters. Why don't we have that? Well, we probably never did. You know, on the sound, we, we, we had some places, Horton's Lighthouse, or oh, you guys are South Forkers. Uh, you know, uh, 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 probably Nappy, uh, Montauk, there were no doubt places where there was wild oyster set, but not like these seed beds. And so they would bring them up and, and, and culture them. And the other really interesting thing back then was, uh, here's an interesting concept for you. It's called gear inefficiency. I love that. Does this guy look like he's being very efficient? Well, he looks like Frank Zappa, actually. Uh, you know how hard it is to, this guy could be working in 20 feet of water, which means that these, these uh, tonging stales are like 30 feet long. And what you would do is take them and go, drop it down to the bottom, and then go, and then bring them up 25 something feet, dump it on the culling board, culling, culling board, boom, open it up, dump them out, take out your whatever oysters you just picked up and all the other stuff you picked up. And boy, you can work all day and you could get a lot of oysters, but let me tell you something. Oh, look, it's like Popeye. Is that his forearm or is that a billowing shirt? I don't know. Either that or this guy's got Popeye arms for sure. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know. It's probably a billowing shirt because uh, he looks kind of scrawny. I mean, boy, I've seen some Bayman uh, in our, our, our Bayman that look a lot hardier than this guy. But anyway, uh, gear inefficiency. And so you could work all day long and you weren't gonna wipe out the oysters very quickly. Uh, and, and so that kind of kept the industry at, at, at a good rate. I love this picture. This is such a cool picture. Is it staged? <laughs> well, here's a schooner at the dock under full sail. <laughs> so I would say that they had to wait for a pretty darn calm day to take that picture. And everyone's wearing a hat. Here's the guy with the bowler. He, he looks kind of like, uh, like uh, W.C. Fields. Or something. This guy is obviously the boss because he has nothing in his hands. He's got his hands behind his back saying, OK, you guy over there. Here's the guy that's tonging. Here's the bushels. Here's all. Here's another uh, bull rake stale. And you've got all these nice, cool little things. And, uh, you know, doesn't that look jovial? It's, I can't believe these clothes. I'm going to get a suit like this to wear when I'm oyster. Because, you know, if I make it through the day in 90 degrees wearing a suit like that, then, then I can prove that I'm an oyster guy, too. Uh, so, you know, it, it was a livelihood for a lot of people, uh, a lot of people. In the 1900s, in Greenport alone, it was fueling at, with auxiliaries, you know, eight, nine hundred plus people because you had... Even in this picture, you had to you had to have the people making the casks. So there's a street in, in, in Greenport called Cooper Street. That's where the Cooper lived that made the casks. 
uh, for shipping oysters, and there'll be a picture of a cask shipping oysters. You had to have the people working the boats. You had to have people building the boats. You had to have people repairing the boats. You had to have the oyster shuckers. You had to have all of these things going on uh, for this industry, and it, it required a lot of people. Uh, and so it hired a lot of people. A couple of the pieces of equipment. So here again are these tongs, and they look like they look like salad tongs. Except, you know, depending on how deep you had to work, that's how long these these handles or stales had to be. Same with a bull rake. It, uh, you let the boat do the work. You might be in thirty feet of water. You throw this thing over and kind of let the boat drift as it's dragging, and you pick it up. And then, of course, you have the dredge. Now, if it was a dredge under under sail, uh, you know, you'd set your sail and you'd, you'd dredge and you had to have to be a pretty good sailor and doing your tacking or whatever, going off the wind and, 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 and getting your stock. And, and so this was a, a, quite a livelihood. And then came the modern steam dredge. And again, like a lot of things that we do as... Uh, <laughs> As, as enterprising humans that we are, uh, we, we learn to be more efficient. And a lot of times that leads to, let's say, uh, issues, okay? So if you have unregulated dredging of oysters, uh, you, 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 can, you can do a lot of uh, harvesting, let's say. So this was, you know, this was uh, certainly making people a lot of money, but maybe less mom and pop people making as much money and, and certainly other things going on. But, but if you were in a big oyster company, uh, you were doing quite well. And, you know, I, I, I've gotten mixed um, information about where this shell ended up. Uh, I would, I've been told by some people that they did indeed put a lot of this back out onto the grounds, which would be called culching the, culching the, the beds. So that what you would be doing is, let's say you were out in Napique and you were harvesting and harvesting and harvesting and shucking and shucking and collecting all this shell. If you put the shell back where you were working, the thought would be that oysters that you didn't harvest would spawn, the spawn would go into the water, it would set on shell, and you would have a kind of regenerative uh, industry happening. Uh, a, a better a plan might have been to actually bring that shell back up to the shell beds that they were taking them from. Because uh, at some point, we're going to see that this industry collapsed. And I would say that, you know, this might have been a critical reason that the, when, the, when the seedbeds gave out, why did they give out? It could have been because literally all the habitat was, was taken out and not replaced. So it's a, it's a recycling for, a, you know, if, this, if, if all that shell went into making roads or making, you know, uh, a chicken feed or these kind of things and never went back into the water, uh, that, that would have started leading, maybe not in the Peconic, because you remember, th th this, there were not a lot of wild oyster set. You, you do get oyster set in the Peconic, no doubt. But, you know, I just keep thinking that I understand why they wouldn't bring the shell back up to the seed beds. It would have been a, a one-way expense trip on there. They would have had to pay for loading that shell up on barges, taking them to the seed beds for no profit, except if you were patient. Uh, so I, I have to look into that a little bit more um, but you, I have, and you don't find much information on it. So if anyone knows out there, I've been told by locals in Greenport, oh yeah, they used to take all that shell and, and, and put it back out on the beds, culching the, the flats. Um, so that's interesting. A lot of the boats, 
uh, and they all have these con these conveyors that would literally uh, convey the oysters up to the top of the shucking house and uh, where the oysters would be shucked. There's a nice picture of, of the conveyor belt shoveling these oysters up for processing. And here's Lester and Toner in, in Greenport. Uh, that's now a condominium. A lot of these oyster factories are now all condominiums and things. Are not, there, there are none of these left. They're, they're none, none active anymore. Uh, in 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 Long Island, uh, there are some, I believe, in the Chesapeake, but it's it's not it's different. It, it, you don't really get canned oysters anymore. Here's a picture of a shucking house, and and there are vats where there were water heaters, and you could you would uh, be putting the oysters in the cans. And uh, here's a label from Shelter Island Oyster Company. Some of these labels are kind of valuable. If you go on eBay, you can get the tins and, and sometimes other, other clay pots. And uh, Chris Pickerel has did a little talk on his, on his oyster uh, pots that he had, very cool from, from way back when. But this is a more modern Shelter Island Oyster Company uh, label and showing a little picture there and Shelter Island Oyster Company. Ask for them. And again, here's a cooper, uh, a, a, a cask rather, with a nice burlap top on it. And you, you, would, you would put the oysters in there and they would be able to be uh, transported uh, pretty, pr pretty efficiently as far as their uh, shelf life, tremendous shelf life. And, and more modern, you know, before there was refrigerated trucks, you could put them on a, on a, on a schooner off or, or a, a packet off to, uh, to Europe. And it, it might take weeks to get there, but they would travel in, in these casks. Maybe, maybe they put a little bit of seaweed on the top of the burlap and keep it moist and, and keep it as cool as they could, didn't keep it in the blaring sun. But here's a more modern uh, refrigerated truck. Now, uh, that, was the, that, that was when things were really booming. And again, if we went back to that graph, you would see 1900 to 1910, 1920s, doing okay, but it's starting to take a dip. And then some, some r really dramatic dips. And then World War II, which took a lot of the, the labor away and, and also, you know, kind of austerity and, and, and rationing and these things. And, and then other things leading to decline, including pollution, Irregular sets of oysters, and I would say irregular sets of oysters. Connecticut, big time irregular sets of oysters. But again, the seed beds, irregular sets of oysters. And then this one here, disease. If you if you go along to the Chesapeake, you'll see that you know pretty pretty uh, modern times. And I'm going to say you know sixties, seventies, eighties you get start to get these diseases that really just kind of devastate the industry there. Um, and, and with us, but not as much, especially with uh, these two diseases. JOD is, is what used to be called juvenile oyster disease. It's now called Rosia varus. Uh, it does exist still. But the interesting thing is, and Barley could get into more of this with the group about this, how juvenile oyster disease was kind of bred out of the system through selective breeding, whereas dermo, which is a parasite, and MSX, MSX stands for multinucleated spheroid unknown, but it's now known. So uh, it, it, it's, uh, oh, I thought I had... I thought I had muted my phone. There we go. Sorry about that. Could have sworn I muted my phone. I'll mute it again. I'll turn it off. I'll turn it off. Okay. Uh, that was on tape. That was probably my 
who knows who that was. So my mother's 91st birthday today. Happy birthday, mom. Uh, MSX, multinucleated spheroid unknown, is a known parasite. Dermo is a parasite. These ones, you don't, you try to breed these out of the system, but it's not, it's, it, 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 it doesn't really work that well. Juvenile oyster disease, now Rosia varus, we can get a handle on. But these ones here, by the way, on Long Island, we've got derma. We can work around derma. It doesn't wipe us out. In the Chesapeake, Dermo and MSX keep some pretty knocked back because they never have our, our cold winters. And if you didn't know this, by the way, now that it's gotten to be nice and sunny and warm and the water's warming up, humans love warm winters, some do. Uh, oyster growers should not like warm winters. Warm winters are not the greatest thing when you're culturing oysters because you might see disease pressure of your oysters to dermo in the spring following a warm winter. Uh, and you won't see a wipeout of all your oysters, but you might see, you might have a hundred oysters and now you have 10 of them are dead when they were like perfect, just ready to eat. That could be derma, 10% in, in a month and another 10%. That's derma. MSX will wipe them all out. We don't want, you know, I'm going to say this right now because this is, a, this is I, I prompt myself to, to get on a pedestal for a minute. If you go to a fish market and for some odd reason, now that you're oyster growers, you actually buy oysters from the fish market and you didn't ask where they were from or whatnot and you ate you bought three dozen and you ate two dozen and you live on the water and you put the other dozen back in the water. If those oysters were from the Chesapeake, you could have just added MSX to the water. So never put oysters that you don't know where they came from back in the water. If you're growing your own oysters at bar with barley and whatnot, and you're moving them around a little bit, then you know where they came from and where they were grown and the water they were in. But if you go to Trader Joe's and buy, I don't know if Trader Joe's sells oysters. I've never been in a Trader Joe's, but I hear you can make fun of Trader Joe's. So I'm making fun of Trader Joe's right now. Uh, if you go to Trader Joe's and they happen to be selling oysters and you buy a bunch for a party, don't put them back in any water. Don't put the shell back in the water, okay? And all these things, by the way, are federal uh, rules. So you would be breaking federal, and they're going to catch you too. Here's my finger. There it is. They're going to catch you too. Okay. Disease pressure and predation. Hallelujah. If you're growing oysters, you're very familiar with some of the predators that come around. I think I have a, I have a whole, a whole uh, lecture on, uh, it's called, what the heck's going on with my oysters? That's the what the heck's going on with my oysters lecture. If Barley wants it, he can borrow it he, and tell everyone what the heck's going on with my oysters, including all these predators and fowlers and things like that. But what's really interesting is back in the 1900s, what was the predator? It was the sea star. And it, it, it's, it's a kind of a, it's a tragic but funny story in a way, because you could just picture these old codgers on board and they're picking up a sea star and it's eating their oyster and they see it's eating their oyster and they happen to have their trusty hatchet or machete and they hack this thing to pieces and throw it overboard. They just basically made lots of new sea stars. It's a sea star in the kinoderm, very interesting, uh, uh, has a central ring and you can cut this thing anywhere along the central ring and it'll regenerate an entirely new sea star. You can't cut the arm off and the arm will grow a new sea star. The sea star will grow a new arm, but if you cut anywhere along the central ring, it will grow another sea star. So for a while, if they were hacking them up and throwing them overboard, uh, hallelujah, you got an infestation of sea stars. Here's an interesting thing. I never even noticed this and I've been giving this thing for a little while. John Plock. John Plock was the president of, of, of Shelter Island Oyster Company. Um, that's kind of cool. There's John Plock. So somewhere along the line, these guys, they knew this was a major predator. 
and they set out to eradicate these things and they really did. I mean, it's hard to find a sea star in, in Peconic Bay. You can find them under the Ponaquad Bridge. You used to be able to. There was kind of a sea star blight a couple of years ago, and they were really quite uh, difficult to find if you want them for education. You know, you put them in your touchy-feely tank for the kids. They're harder to get these days. Uh, but somewhere along the line, when this was going on, they made a law, and I believe the law still stands, that if you are a bay person and you take a predator out of the water, you're not allowed to put it back. So in other words, if you were dredging for your oysters and you got sea stars, you couldn't just throw them overboard. You had to take them back to shore and leave them like in, at the dump. Or, or in a place, you couldn't put them back in the water to try to eradicate these things from wiping out the grounds. Now, they did it. <laughs> they really did that. They had what they called mops. They would mop these things out. They would just, they, they, I, I'm told they also used some like lime, <laughs> liming the beds to kill the sea stars and all these things that you could never do now. Um, but they really got rid of them. Uh, and of course, was that the end of predation? <laughs> so I don't know how many other predators I have here. Well, I've got this one and don't underestimate this little tiny snail called the oyster drill, your selfinx. Looks like a little ice cream cone. And by the way, when you see a hole in your oyster caused by the oyster drill, it's not because he drilled it in with this little ice cream cone spire. He's got a little organ called a radula that rasps a hole into the shell and then injects digestive fluids that will liquefy the, the shellfish he wants to eat and it'll suck the thing out uh, as, as liquefied. So these little oyster drills are a major predator. If you are gardening your oysters uh, and you have these in your cages, you really, as a bay person, don't put them back in the water. Now, if you're with your grandson and they and they're Buddhists and they uh, and 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 they or otherwise just hate to see you do anything bad, just stuff them in your pocket and and you'll forget about them. And your wife or your husband will wash them and find them there in the laundry. I know my wife does, and so I'm not allowed to use the washing machine anymore. But I'll get my own uh, to wash my oyster drills that are in my pocket. Same with crabs, you know, you can, it's really hard to, to crush a crab when your grandson is watching you. Or, <laughs> but, uh, you know, predators, if you're, if you're a farmer, boy, you, you're just working on getting these predators away from your stock that will eat them. And uh, one of the bigger predators, and the good news is it's also a big fishery, is the, uh, the, the whelk. The, uh, the channeled whelk and, and uh, the chambered whelk, uh, they call them winkles or the winkle, tra winkle traps catching the skangeel, you know, it's the, the, the conch, the big snail. And they, they're shellfish predators, uh, but they're also a major fishery out here. And unfortunately, on that note, the bait for the, a lot of these guys is the horseshoe crab. I just saw a guy was out at Dune Road today, and there was the guy in his boat getting the horseshoe crabs for his winkle trap bait. And it's kind of sad because horseshoe crabs used to be everywhere. And, you know, we have to be so on top of our environment because, you know, if we think that everything is just endless, it just isn't. We have to be very careful about all these things out there, including horseshoe crabs. And then there's the... Uh, the advent of evasive species. Now, here's the Asian shore crab, and it's where's it from? Uh, Asia. Okay, it's not our local crab, uh, voracious predator, as is the green crab, non-indigenous non crab. So, you know, where do these things come from? They can come from all kinds of uh, vectors, including bilge water. You know, if you're if, if you've got a 
a, a, a container ship or something and it, and it pumps its bilge water. That's, a, that's where, by the way, the, the uh, zebra mussel came from in the Great Lakes was from bilge water. Bilge water is a great way of, of moving things around that aren't really supposed to be dumped in your water. But uh, so we have the Asian shore crab, which is a non, non-indigenous and the green crab. Boy, do we have crabs. I mean, you could name all the crabs. We've got the indigenous ones, the blue claw crab. That's the only good crab because all is fair in love and war. They're a predator. I'm a predator of blue claws. Like I'll eat as many as I can get. Okay. So that's fair. Lady crabs, which are similar to blue crabs, but not as tasty, but they're a swimming crab. And then you've got those little crabs that you've seen a gazillion of, the mud crab, uh, lots of mud crabs, a couple different species of mud crab that we have. And um, spider crabs, we've got uh, spider crabs and we've got, um, oh, there's a whole host of, of crabs. There's so many different crabs. And uh, they're all pretty much predators. Okay, there's a little, there's a little tidbit. You might, we're just about to enter. What month is it? It's May third. It's May twenty seventh. It's my mom's birthday. May doesn't have an R in it. I hope everyone's. Uh, uh, I hope everyone is wondering if they can eat their oysters in May. R in season. What does that mean? are in season don't eat don't eat oysters in the months that don't have an r in them what months are those may june and july august is okay august well it depends on where you're from okay all right may june july august don't have r's in them now, why wouldn't you eat an oyster in those four months? And the reason why, and by the way, before I tell you the reasons why, I'm going to say that you can eat oysters year round. Because the month with, well, I, there's so many ways of prefacing this before I say it. How, I don't know if I should. Well, I will. Okay. Cultured oysters from certified waters, handled correctly from, from a, 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 an, an oyster company. You can eat them year round, okay? The, the, there's no restriction on, on eating them, okay? So what was the story with the, with the months without the R? Well, here's how it goes. I ate an oyster today. I even brought oysters home to make fried oysters today. It's May. Well, the cultured oysters, I grew them. I opened them up and it's May, late May. This oyster, I should take one out of the refrigerator. I got them right there. I could open it up and show you, but basically it's full of spawn. The gonad is, I could spawn, I could have taken it instead of putting it in the refrigerator, I could have put it on a spawning table and I could have made new oysters. Okay, I already have my new oysters. I did the spawns in February, as did barley. We, we know, we know as, as aquaculturists when to grow our oysters. We could do a spawn tomorrow. Take the oysters out, put them, play our little games that we play, spawn and make more oysters, no problem. In the wild, oysters have been in hibernation for the winter. They come out of hibernation the algae's growing well, the water temperature's coming up, and they put on reproductive growth so that they can spawn and give back to, to their species and recruit into the fishery. So a wild oyster is, is getting ready for that event in May, might be doing that event in June and July, and in August, uh, is spawned out and needs to recharge. So the first reason for this and why it was made a law early on was to keep the, the oyster recruiting into the environment. In other words, giving, making new, making baby oysters. Okay. Making ba and by the way, you should know, here's a, here's a cocktail 
one-liner. Everyone write this down for you. Oysters are protandric hermaphrodites. And I knew you knew that, okay? I, I know you knew that, but what did you know? You knew that when they're born, they're all male. They're male first, protandric, all male. And then in their life cycle, they will hopefully 50% switch to female and the literature will say, and they can go back and forth. Well, they, here's a scientific term for you. They don't do it willy nilly. Okay. That's scientific. Willy nilly is scientific was Dr. Willy nilly to you. Okay. Uh, if they're stressed, they can revert probably to more female. If the environment's stressed, the females make the egg. Males, as with humans, are practically worthless. I mean, you need like one male in the world and, and be, let's not go there. The, the female is the valuable one of the, of the sexes because that's the eggs that will make new. So if the environment's stressed, you might get more females so that you get more into the environment, okay? So there was a reproductive reason for the R. Now let's add the culinary reason. Okay, now, did I like that oyster I ate full of spawn? Well, it was full of spawn. <laughs> it was fine. It was pretty full of spawn. <laughs> sure looked milky. Um, so there is a culinary component to it. It's not, it is row on, but it's a little different than some row, I suppose. But more importantly, in August, when you see an oyster that's spawned out, there's not much to it. It looks kind of watery and a bag full of water. It's, 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 there's no way that it looks or tastes as good as it did in March. Uh, which they're just so fabulous, March and April and, you know, even February, they're just so fabulous. And then August is like, uh, uh, that doesn't mean they're not tasty. And if, you know, for all you folks that think you like oysters, but really you just like horseradish, you know, oh, horseradish on an oyster, that's sacrilege. Never mind. I'm not, uh, one day we'll, we'll talk uh, eating oysters, but if you're an oyster purist, you would never put cocktail sauce on an oyster. Maybe a drop of lemon. Uh, I like mignonette. I've been, I, I've been doing mignonette and a couple other things, or if you're cooking them or whatnot. But, you know, there is a culinary aspect to the months with R as well on both sides. Too much spawn, spawned out. Post breeding thinness, it's called. Okay, so there's a culinary part. And then later, on there becomes uh, a pollution part so you might think that for a couple reasons the months with with without the r you have uh, warmer temperatures uh, you might have the summer <laughs> which you do and you might have people coming out or let's call it tourists or just people, more people, and you can get a proliferation of bacteria in, in, in a lot of the creeks. And so you can have closures in the summer uh, in those months that don't have an R. And so there's a, a, a potential for health reasons as well. So those are kind of the reasonings behind the, 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 uh, the months with R are the best months to eat. But again, I'm gonna say, that doesn't mean that summer comes along and you can't eat oysters. You, uh, if, and here's why, by the way, a cultured oyster isn't very old. A lot of the oyster growers are only growing an oyster to the size that they want them in 18 months or less. And at that point, they really aren't putting on a lot of gonad to speak of anyway. So, you know, you, you, you're not getting the same issue there. And as far as recruitment into the fishery, these are cultured oysters. We're, we're creating them and they do spawn. They definitely spawn. Are, are we relying on them for wild set? 
we're not really re relying on anything for wild set. We would like to bring oysters back and there's projects that are trying to work on enhancement and bringing oysters back. But there's a, uh, you know, there's kind of an apple and an orange here. There's aquaculture for cultured oysters for food. And then there's, uh, there's restoration work and oyster reef building for other reasons. And the kind of, the, the, the the, the culture, the oyster culture, including yourselves, are doing all the good as well as growing oysters. Uh, oyster grower for harvesting oysters is still doing all the good and selling oysters. And so uh, if you're building reefs, you're not after eating the oysters. You're after creating the habitat, creating the brood stock creating, you know, an environment where oysters can self-perpetuate. It's, so it's, it's a little different. And you can do both. It's, it's not, they're not mutually exclusive. Oh, I just said all of that stuff. Okay. Uh, so I'm not going to go through it. I just said it all. Uh, did I say anything else? Summer months or yeah. Okay. I said it all. Good. Said, it's, like, it's, it's like David Burns. Say it once. Why say it again? Um, yeah. Okay. Did that go over your head? You have to listen to talking heads. Did that go over your talking head? I love that. See, if I were doing this live, I would maybe hear one or two people chuckling a little bit. <laughs> like they were getting my humor. But it's okay. I'm looking at, I'm, I'm sitting in my, my little domain and uh, feeling somewhat lonely, but hoping that you're out there going. <laughs> okay. Now. Uh, how do we culture oysters? And hopefully Barley or anybody is, is cluing you into all of, the, all of the nuances of aquaculture, like algae culture. You know, he mentioned at the beginning about kelp being all the rage, which it is. Uh, I would like to think that unicellular microalgae will become all the rage one day because maybe we'll be using this for all of our biofuel. It's not happening now. Right now, you know, barley and I grow it to feed our animals. This is what they eat, unicellular microalgae, all kinds of flavors we, we do for them. And let me tell you something, and your leader, Barley, he's been doing this a long time. I've been doing it a long time. We all know that this part is, cr is just crushingly important and, and, and can be such a make it or break it every year of what we do. It's, it's just kind of silly how, how much attention we have to spend on growing algae. But that's the food, that's the base of the f aquaculture food chain. And the, the uh, you know, the freeze-dried supplement of this just isn't the same. It, it'll work, but not like good live algae. So we have to grow our own algae. And these are stock cultures of different species of algae. And we grow them up. And here's this, what's called a sea cap system, which you guys have one of these. It's a sea salter continuous algae culture machine. And it, and it grows a lot of algae and you need a lot of algae. So if you, if, uh, if you get involved in it or you know, uh, it, it, at least listen to the lecture. It's pretty fascinating because it's, it's plant-like. It's not a, it's a protist. It's, it's plant-like and it's very fast growing. So this has, you know, Lufthansa has flown planes on biofuel made out of algae, as has the uh, United States Air Force. So there's huge potential. I have a whole lecture on algae and it includes the use of it as a, as uh, 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 a source for biofuel that blows corn and ethanol off the chart. But it's, you know, people know how to grow corn. They don't know how to grow algae yet. So we'll see. Well, keep your eye on that. It's, it might be coming. And there also are all, so many different kinds of algae. The only one that comes to mind that people kind of eat are spirulina, which is a, a, a freshwater algae that they you melt down into little blue tablets and sell to yuppies for ungodly amount of mo money to do something that I'm not entirely sure what it is. But it all sounds good to me, and I should be in the spirulina uh, trade, uh, but I'm not. So that's a algae. Oh, we bought, if you come to the Marine Center, I don't know if Barley will get one of these. He's, you guys are going to have to donate a lot more money to the cause to get these algae photo bioreactors. We bought, 
we, we, we got it on a grant and we bought four of them. They're about $60,000 a piece. They look like a big R2-D2 uh, and, and they are touch screen automated self-cleaning algae machines that are really actually quite temperamental. Uh, I'm not, uh, two years ago I was sold on them. Uh, last year I wasn't as sold and this year I'm not sold at all, but what, that doesn't mean it's over yet. They, there's a, there's a learning curve to everything. And I don't know if these, uh, these in the right hands are a wonderful tool. And um, hopefully I will be one day the right hand, the hand of the king. And now that's over your head. No, that's Game of Thrones over your head. I had to rewatch that. Here's the live larval cycle. So you have an adult. And... <laughs> Unless you were a scallop, which are, by the way, serial hermaphrodites, always both male and female. So one scallop can actually create a new scallop. In this case, I don't know why they show just one adult. You've got to have two. And one of them has to be a male and one of them has to be a female. Uh, this must have been a age appropriate <laughs> larval cycle because they don't have the S word sperm. There's no sperm. So let's say that this is a female and gives off an egg. Well, there should be another one over here uh, that's a male that gives off sperm. The egg, eggs are broadcast into the water, spawn goes out. And by the way, you know, if you didn't know this, here's your next cocktail uh, one-liner. Oysters are probably the, the queens of fecundity, uh, which means they're they, they produce a, a huge amount of eggs. So the literature, I've seen references of upwards of 50 million eggs in a, in a big fecund female, 50 million eggs. Now routinely, and Barley would know this and I would know this, that routinely you can count on from one female a couple million eggs. So, uh, so you can have 12 female oysters and get, you know, get your half a billion larvae. And that's not eggs. That's just the larvae the next day, whatever eggs fertilized. Why? Why would, a, why would an oyster give off so many eggs? Well, because they broadcast them into the water. And then all bets are off. I mean, they're off. All bets are off. Everything wants to eat the egg. Everything wants to eat every form of the thing. Everything wants to get, and they need to fertilize. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a bit of a crapshoot spawning in the bay. If you're in, a, if you're in a spawning table in the hatchery, well, you can catch every egg and you can fertilize every egg. That's why we can produce a lot of, uh, of larvae and a lot of oysters because we can control it. But nature, you know, uh, what's a good spat fall? What's a good set? It depends on so many things in nature for that to happen. Because first of all, they broadcast into the water. The, the sperm has to find the egg and fertilize it. Then it goes through its larval cycle. It starts to divide. It starts to divide. It becomes its first larval cycle, which is a trochophore. There's a whole lecture on all of this stuff. If you want, and, and I, you know, Barley and I share, you can go on the SPAT website. All the lectures are all on PowerPoints. They're all encoded and recorded and this is and that. So COVID made me go do this instead of, you know, one off. I never wanted to do this because it's not as much fun as, as doing it live and in person and on, and, and, uh, what's the word? Uh, improvisational each time, but, but the larvae is not improvisational. It goes from a trochophore to a veliger, to an eyed veliger, to a, to a juvenile. This would be spat or set, and the cycle continues. Okay, and if you wanna see this, uh, you can see this under the microscope. You can, you can see this operation if he lets you in the hatchery or if you r help run the hatchery or you look online, you can see all this stuff. You can, you can do a spawn. Uh, you could do a spawn, you know, you can do a spawn at your dock. Just take a bucket on a sunny day, go clam. Have you ever gone clamming? And you get a bunch of clams and you put them in a bucket of salt water because you figured you were 
purging them or cleaning them and the sun's beating down on the bucket and you look in the bucket and it's all cloudy it's like what happened well they spawn because that's one of the tricks is elevating the temperature i've seen that happen we've done it with scallop we do solar spawns with scallops all all through june and july let people i once did a, a touch tank up in east hampton at like martyrs or something and all the kids were around and the scalps were in the tank the sun beating down on the tank and they started spawning and how do you explain that to a little tiny kid what's that uh, well it's uh that's eggs uh it's little going to be little scallops go talk to your parents about it get away or as wc fields would say get away from me kid you bother me <laughs> no i didn't say that i didn't say that Okay, but you can actually do a spawn at your dock. And, and if you had a little microscope, uh, you, you might be able to see some of these things. Uh, yes, or come our way, we'll show them to you. What? You didn't tell me I had an expiration date. Okay, well, so, <laughs> okay, so thanks for telling me. No, I can get this done in 15 minutes. I don't wanna bore anybody. Uh, I'll just meander less. So here's our oysters that spawned our brood stock. Uh, now they turned into clams and we elevate the temperature and we play some games with them. And we raise the larvae in these special tanks called larval rearing conicals. And then we, we set them on a special little tiny shell chip called uh, microculch. You could set them on big shell chip like that. Look at, this is a piece of, uh, of clam shell and, and you can, almost count, there's like a, th a thousand or more oysters. One, two, three, four, five, blah, 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 blah. lots of oysters. How many of them would make it on that shell? A couple, and that's why we don't use a big, big chunk of shell. You could knock these off and make little shell things. We raise them in all kinds of different machines. Again, there's lectures on all this. This happens to be some very kind of rudimentary uh, floating, uh, floating upweller systems or flupsies, they work tremendously. This is what I call appropriate technology. And if you wanna learn more about it, fascinating stuff, really great. Uh, we built 70 of them for this project all out of aluminum. Whoop, that was the center trunk lines and we, we built uh, 70 of them. And, and actually we could negotiate giving these away to nonprofits if you're interested. I built a solar one. Uh, it was great until somebody from the town that it was at stole the batteries out of it, which is a very expensive part, but it worked great. So you can go remote on that. We build our own silos, barrels, uh, recycling barrels. So there's a mesh here and you put the animals up and, and the water flows from the bottom and out. And it's pretty straightforward. But we built a lot of barrels. There's our crew of, of burly young ladies holding up the flupsy barrels. And we can grow seed in them up to tremendous size. And, and uh, those are coming out of a floating up weller. Uh, a lot of oyster companies getting involved. There's some more and barley should be on this list. I'm gonna have to add barley's got an oyster company even. Why you would want an oyster company. See that guy's vertebrae? He's missing a couple, just like me. But it's, it's catching on. Now, we talked at the beginning about aquaculture then. It's a totally new form of aquaculture. We don't have big shell piles uh, on, the, uh, on the docks, but we have boutique perfect single oysters like that. It, it, it just, they, they're world-class, very excellent oysters. And they are, again, remember the Eastern oyster, they're our oyster and they're, they beat every oyster. They really do. Um, and there's what, the oyster growers have what I call value out added because all of these things are benefits from culturing oysters. Relieves harvest of wild stock. Uh, they, they enhance into the uh, recruit into the uh, fishery. They obviously filter and they provide habitat. I did a grant looking at blackfish. There was one in every cage. Here's Barley's new boat that he just got on your tax dollars. That's Barley driving down the streets of of East Hampton. Now that's in France, but one day we'll have one of those. The question of pearls, this is a Japanese black pearl oyster. They make a pearl. Ours don't make a pearl. And Barley is gonna tell you why in, in a future talk, because I'll give you the punchline. There's no true maker layer, which is what this is, but he'll explain that to you. 
He also mentioned about The Big Oyster and Mark Kurlansky. I've only gotten to page four, but I will read it. I, 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 there were some questions I had and I was like, ah, this guy, but I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna readdress it. I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, that's me eating oysters in France. Go to France, eat oysters. This is my mom who turns 91 today. Those are not our oysters. Those are Pacifics. That's what they grow in France. They don't even grow the European flat oyster anymore. They grow the Pacifics, okay? That's them decorating it, which we don't have to do. They decorate their oysters because when they sell them, notice there's no ice on anything. But boy, do the French eat oysters. Oh my gosh, but no ice. We'd never get away with that. They even have, that's an oyster vending machine in France. Can you believe it? You can go there, stick your dollar in and either a Mars bar comes out or a dozen oysters. There's your famous leader's hatchery. And there he is, barley in the flesh. Same gear, larval rearing conicals, bright smile, he's wearing a spat hat, trader. Uh, you guys out there teaching, which is what this whole program is all about education and knowledge and community. Uh, my program, I've got lots of, I have volunteers come in every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and there's a lot of them. We do celebration, we didn't get to do it this year, so we did it virtually, we'll do it again next year if you want to come to Greenport for celebration. We have a manual. We share it with you if you want. It's, 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 it, it addresses everything we're talking about on a community level, not too scientific. Uh, I have a facility at Tiana on Dune Road. We have 60 growers there uh, doing it. This We've replaced swim noodles with the proper floats so it doesn't look quite so festive, but it's more environmentally sound. Conscious Point has a hatchery that you guys are, can get involved in. Uh, one of my guys, uh, Howard Reisman, is there, and Barley is working there. And the Billion Oyster Project you probably heard about is in Manhattan, and you can get involved with some stuff they're doing, too. Uh, it's all, we're all in the same boat. I, I believe that's the last slide, so I could actually stop sharing. And there I am, and here comes my wife in from her thing. And so, you know, we're all doing the same thing. We're, we're learning, we're, we're, uh, we're sharing, we're becoming better stewards of the environment. Uh, we're trying to do something that people need to do more and more of, which is quality of life. Right, right, Barley? And uh, thanks for coming out and you know, stick with it. If you have any questions, you can get through to me through Barley or if you wrote down my email and we can network and it's all great because we're all on the same boat. Good. Did I make it in my 15 minutes? Yes, you did. Hey, that's pretty good, huh? Not bad at all. It was a great talk. Good. Well, thanks everybody. And we'll catch you uh, on the water. All right. Are we good, guys? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to throw up? Uh, do you want me to throw up the the uh, line for a second? See if anyone wants to call in. We got a, we sure. got some time for a, for a, for a quick talk. All right, listeners. The uh, number to dial in is up on top of the screen. It's six zero nine six six three zero five seven four. And I'm amazed my dyslexia didn't kick in. <laughs> Yeah, and there's, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of questions that people could be thinking they might want to ask, and and we have lots of time. We're, we're, we're always around. It's not like this was a one-off and you wanted to ask questions, but you just didn't feel like the time was right. Barley and I are in this for the long haul. At least Barley is. <laughs> I bet, no, I am too, because my volunteers are in their 80s, so I can't retire until at least I'm in my 80s as well. So, you know, so it, we're, we're around and, and we'll, we'll have events and we'll do oysters and we'll do these things. So. Very accessible. Okay, no callers so far. Uh, Barley, are there, is there any uh, points that you would like to go and ask him about? Just to maybe clarify for the audience in the last few minutes? Uh... No, I mean, Kim pretty much nailed it as usual. 
Um, what I always say is most people won't ground truth us no matter what we tell them. They probably have to try to believe it because until you learn the language and that's what we're doing, right? We're, we're teaching people to, to, to walk the walk so that when you walk into a restaurant and you say, where are these oysters from? And they say, I don't know. Then, you know, not to order them. Things like that, you yeah. know. Uh, uh, one of the things that I, I, like you said, I like people to know is that we have one species of oyster on the East Coast. That's the uh, one of the huge take-home messages. It, it is, and it's amazing that that, that would be a... Uh, it isn't maybe that much of a mystery, but it is fascinating that there's one oyster on the East Coast. Yeah. And, and, and it, uh, that's why it's such a ch kind of a cherished species because nobody else really legally has one of those things but us. And it's really a fabulous oyster too. And uh, awesome. you know, it's funny how Blue Point got such a reputation because it's like, are those Blue Points? Can't uh, tell you how many times I hear that. A million times. It, and and so, so, so that's why we're doing what we're doing to just get people a little bit more savvy to something as important fundamentally as this little guy the oyster which does so many things so aside and, oh sorry i wanted to ask uh, so aside from uh asking where your oysters are from what are some takeaways maybe for our viewers um that we can quickly condense like just a few pull-up points between the two of you well i i have a term that i've been quoted a bunch of time a canary in a coal mine you know if you're watching your shellfish and you're not just your shellfish but but your marine environment and if you're noticing changes in these things what it's signaling for you to do is to become more aware of the environment and issues and be proactive rather than inactive and that's that's critical because the marine system is 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 pretty hardy but it's not indestructible and we have to be helping more than hurting that's my take home message about this whole program is to become better stewards of of our environment because we live in one of the most beautiful places on the planet and yeah. we have to cherish it every day yeah one of the one of our gardeners today was talking about and, and this is exactly what we shoot for is that when he was tending to his cage just all the life in that cage and the fact that the lack of eelgrass and other habitat in the harbors they're just they're deserts they're barren bottoms so having this stuff floating around the gear the oyster gear floating around is providing so much habitat and that's what you know the oyster gardeners are, are seeing firsthand and that's why we need to get more people in and on the water it's and as you mentioned that barley you know if they're with their kids or their grandkids they spark uh, an inquisitiveness that can go the distance. So yeah. it's contagious. You know, the, 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 the mystery of opening up a cage and literally seeing 20 different things. And if you're the adult in the room and you know what they are and you can show them, then that can be a lifelong uh, quest of yeah. knowledge. Yeah. And that's critical. A short critical. little period of time, uh, a life changer. Absolutely. Okay, there's no callers on the line, guys. Um, with that said, I want to say uh, thank you so much. Uh, from LTV, I just want to say thank all of you guys so much. This was a fantastic talk, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I know a lot of our listeners did too. Thank Great. you very much. Thanks Thanks for having us. Kim. And Kim in the background. <laughs> yeah, <you're coming>. thank you. <laughs> and, and now it's all complete. Everybody Good. have a fantastic weekend. Take care and stay safe out there. Thanks. Yep. See ya. Thank you. Hey, Barley. We'll be in touch. Yes. Yes. Thanks again, man.